and welcome to The Book Was Better, where we're fixing today's movies one book at a time. So who doesn't like a good Disney film? The animation, the timeless stories, the fun characters, and hell. Even though they're for kids, sometimes the action is pretty intense. Personally, I've always been a fan of Aladdin, and you can see my thoughts on it right here. But every now and then, Disney screws up, and I'm not just talking about the insipid, repetitive tripe that is the It's a Small World ride. It's a small world after all. No! No! Anything but that. No, today we're looking at a different mistake. The Black Cauldron. Perhaps the result of too ambitious a project for Disney at the time, or maybe too many cooks in the kitchen, the Black Cauldron was mired with poor creative choices, last-minute editing that removed over 12 minutes of footage from the final product, and scenes so graphic that it's hard to believe someone tried to put this in a kid's movie. These scenes include having a zombie slitting a man's throat, seeing an evil henchman dissolve in mist like it was acid, and having the underaged Princess Eleanor's dress get torn and having her humiliated with partial nudity. Yeah, really. I mean, damn! Disney does some dark shit every now and then, but this was pushing it! It was no wonder that parents pulled their crying kids out of test screening. The movie came out in 1985, even though Disney bought the movie rights in 1973. It took 12 years, two major storyboard edits, $44 million in production costs, and 34 miles of film stock before the movie finally came out. And when it did, people were severely disappointed. Poor characters, awkward attempts at very early CGI, and questionable choices, especially in regards to Gurgi, were all noted issues with the film. As such, it was not only a bomb, but it was such a bomb that Disney didn't even release it on home video until 1998, 13 years after its theatrical release. It did so poorly in the domestic box office that it lost to the Care Bears movie. Wow. That is bad. The Chronicles of Perdane series that the movie is based on is rather celebrated, having been nominated for a few Newbery Awards, with the fifth in the series actually winning one. The movie took elements predominantly from the first two books, The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron. For the purposes of review, and time being a factor, these are the only books from the series I've read. The series was written by Lloyd Alexander, dreamer and writer, who also served as a staff sergeant in a counterintelligence division in World War II. Badass. He said that adventure, not college, was the best teacher for a writer, and although he struggled to find success for several years, he was eventually regarded as a successful and influential children's book author. However, when Disney finally made a movie from his books, Alexander said that the adaptation was nothing like what he had written. Just one look at this fuzzy little bastard is all the proof you need. Oh, poor miserable Gurgi deserves fierce smackings and whackings on his poor tender head. So just how bad was this box office bomb? Well. Let's find out for ourselves in the Black Cauldron. So we open to some exposition about the dreaded Black Cauldron itself. Legend has it, in the mystic land of Predain, there was once a king so cruel and so evil that even the gods feared him. There, his demonic spirit was captured in the form of a great black cauldron. So they turned the Lich King into a pot? I don't know. I think I'm sticking with this theory. The black cauldron is used to raise an undead army that adds to their numbers with each enemy they kill in an attempt to take over the world. Does anyone else want to subscribe to the theory that maybe this old king is actually Nerzul? Anyone? The story picks up on an old farm in the kingdom of Perdain. The wizard Dalben is pacing, convinced that something is wrong in the world. The Horned King, that black-hearted devil. What's he waiting for? This is cat. I know you want your breakfast, but just now thinking is more important. You must be new to this whole cat owning thing, huh? Of course, this is leading up to the reveal of our main character, Taryn, a young man wishing for more out of life. So, yeah, he's your traditional Disney princess. I want much more than this provincial life. Oh, Dorben, I was just thinking, what if the war's over and I never had the chance to fight? Hmm, and a good thing too. War isn't a game, people get hurt. But I'm not afraid. 
Ouch! All very smart. Taryn works on Dobbin's farm as an assistant pig keeper, and his most important task is looking out for Henwen, who really is a super pig. Plus, she actually does something. Take that, Wilbur! But how special is she? What can she do? Well, if you dip her head in water, she can see the future. Well, that's... an odd thing to exist. This all comes about because Henwen freaks out after Taryn tries to give her a bath. Helen, what's going on? I don't know. There's something wrong with Henry. What? Oh, quickly, Dad. Bring her inside. What's that for? Put Henwen down. I never use her powers unless I have to. You're using them now just to sate your curiosity. It turns out that the movie's villain, the Horned King, is searching for the Black Cauldron to raise his army with, and Henwen is the key to discovering where it's hidden. So, Dobbin tells Taryn to take Henwen to a cabin deep in the forest to hide. But Taryn has a very active imagination and dreams of becoming a hero. How long until he loses Henwen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. But without the help of my pig Henwen here, I... Henwen? Where are you? Henwen? Henwen disappeared deeper into the forest, and this is where the movie goes from dull to excruciating. Come on out. Here's a lovely... Yeah! Oh. Ooh, great prince. Give poor starving Gurgi munchings and crunchings. This thing is Gurgi. Good prince. Good apple. Oh boy, what a juicy apple. He's like the abandoned love child of Chewbacca and Gollum. And he's nothing like his counterpart in the book. This is Gurgi, or a closer representation of him. But turning the Beastman into this abortion of a mascot character isn't the only thing they've done. Just listen to that fucking voice! Oh, poor miserable Gurgi deserves fierce smackings and whackings on his poor tender head. You got that right! His voice is so grating, so irritating, so goddamn annoying that it makes me want to put on the greatest hits of Justin Bieber to act as a palate cleanser. And this scene of the stolen apple goes on way, way too long. Give it back. I warn you. Come on. Come on, the apple, let's have it. Taryn finds Henwen, but by then it's too late. She's being attacked by a pair of Gwythans, which were described as birds in the books, but Disney decided to make them dragons for some reason. Because birds are harder to draw? And the helpless pig is taken off to the castle of the Horned King. Huh. Kinda looks like my boss's office. Inside the hall of the Horned King, we see his knights and warriors, a collection of hardened criminals and cutthroat villains, an army of... Okay. King Arthur had the Knights of the Round Table. The Horned King has... dick bags. In fact, the main henchman, this shriveled little goblin named Creeper, is busy tormenting Henwen, trying to use her powers to reveal where the Black Cauldron is. I warn you, the King's patience is short. No! 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 Could that scream have any less life in it? I presume, my boy, you are the keeper of this oracular pig. Uh, yes, sir. Then instruct her to show me the whereabouts of the Black Cauldron. This, as you can tell, is the Horned King, and he's easily the best sounding character in the movie. Much better than this furry little mistake. The movie treats him like the big bad villain of Perdane, but in the book, he was just the champion of an even worse king, Aran. Making him the central villain isn't really a bad move, it just throws continuity into question if they ever attempted to make a sequel. But they were never at risk of that happening, so it didn't really matter. Also, when Henwen uses her powers, it looks like she's dropping acid. Oh. 
Taron and Henwen don't reveal the location of the Black Cauldron and attempt an escape. Swim, Hen! Swim! Oh man, that pig has got to be tripping balls right now. The audience is now sober. Taryn tosses the pig into the castle moat, but isn't able to get away himself. <laughs> gotcha, pig boy! Oh good, another obnoxious voice! Because Gurgi wasn't bad enough! So Taryn seems doomed to rot in the dungeon, until he's rescued by Princess Ellenwe. Oh, talk about your role reversals. They poke around the castle for a while until they come across a long-forgotten crypt. One with an ancient sword that Terran can use. Where did you get that sword? Uh, back there. You mean... Well, he's not going to use it. Oh. Our hero, Terran the Grave Robber! I think it's worth noting that even though this sword is basically a lightsaber and even cuts through this thick iron chain, the sword Durnwin from the first book is so powerful that Terran can't even unsheathe it without it burning his arm. Lightsaber's not looking so impressive now, is it? But before the two leave, they also encounter Fluter Flam, traveling bard and all-around poor attempt at a comedy relief. I assure you I had no idea who owned this castle. I just happened to be passing. Oh, right, because I bet you took one look at this and thought this was the perfect place for a leisurely stroll. And I'm going to say this now just because it always seems to come up in the comments section when the movie changes someone's hair color. In the book, Fluter had blonde hair, but here in the movie he has gray. This is wrong, because reasons. Although it does seem to indicate that he's much older in the movie. But there is something I really like about him. He gives us a great example of show, don't tell. Here, watch this scene. I'm Fluna Flam, minstrel of minstrels, balladeer to the grandest cocks in all the land. Huh? And I, well, oh, you've forgotten. <laughs> I have sung in some of the finest courts. Oh. Well, I'm only waiting for an invitation. Oh, shush. This is something carried over from the book. Every time our bard here lies, a harp string snaps. The audience and characters on screen know what's going on, and no one has to spell it out. This writing technique is already uncommon enough as it is, so to see it in a movie that's done so much wrong already is enough to give you whiplash. Despite some close calls, the group is finally able to get away. So now we have a warrior, of sorts, a bard, an aristocrat, and fucking Gurgi returns to join the group. Master? Does this strike anyone else as a bunch of kids playing D&D &D for the first time? What does a girl know about swords anyway? Girl? Girl? If it weren't for this girl, you would still be in the Horned King's dungeon. You know, Princess Ailon Wib, uh, Taran. Ellen Wee also looks like the only person who's not disgusted to see Gurgi here. Oh, you're charming. And pungent, too. Is Gurgi playing a bard too? Because he seems to have put all of his stat points into charisma. <laughs> Laugh, damn it! Gurgi claims to have seen Henwen's tracks, so the group follows him through the woods until they eventually wind up at a pond, which is actually the world's most violent front door. Instead of dying, they wind up in the land of the Fair Folk. Oh, aren't you all darling? Uh, uh, hello, uh, I'm King Idleg of the Fair Folk. How the blazes did they... This is Doling. He's my favorite character. I fixed it. I did fix it. It was perfect. He's very similar in personality to the Dolly of the book, but there is one very notable difference. This Dolly is a fairy, but in the book, the Fair Folks were dwarves. Changing the fair folks to fairies just seems like a lame way to counter all the violence the writers originally had planned. Still, it's kind of fun listening to Dolly bitch and moan all the time. Uh, can I be of any service? It's everything that happens around here my fault. Are you here on a friendly visit? <laughs> and I suppose it's my fault the pig's here too. Henwin? Henwin was actually rescued by the fair folk, who not only offer to watch over her while Taryn and the others journey, but they also give our heroes the last known location of the Black Cauldron. Taryn and company set out for a place called the Marshes of Morva, intent on finding and destroying the cauldron before the Horned King can use it. Even Dolly goes with them to act as a guide. Hey, look, 
Look out, you big clumsy oaf! Look where you... Uh-oh. Welcome to Morva. The shack seems abandoned, but that doesn't stay the case for long as the group runs into a trio of witches. And now, D&D Theater presents... What happens when your DM is a dick? And then you come across three witches. Fluta, what do you do? I cast Charm Person. Ha! You don't mind if I <laughs> pluck your harp. <laughs> you love struck witch! Where is he? Where'd he go? Best day ever! The witches actually own the Black Cauldron, but aren't really interested in giving it away. Perhaps I might interest you in something else. A kettle, a cookpot, a skillet, a teapot, a bucket, a jar, a platter. I don't believe it. Fuck your pottery! After the sword takes out its aggression on the cookware, the lead witch is impressed and changes her mind about trading and says that our heroes can have the cauldron for Terran's sword. Yes. I offer my dearest possession. That I found yesterday in a crypt. The trade works and the witch's hut vanishes, revealing the ancient, evil, almighty black cauldron that our heroes can't move, damage, or destroy. The deal upsets Dolly so much that he transports himself straight to the last 20 seconds of the movie. God. How many internet critics would wish for that superpower? What a bunch of blundering misfits! Things just never work out when you're dealing with people! You can go back to feeding pigs! I've had it! Goodbye! Well, that was rude. But it doesn't take long for the Horned King's soldiers to find and surround them. And Gurky runs away yet again. I feel like I wasted a joke for not using a counting gag for the number of times Gurky runs away. Hello. Trouble. Goodbye. In fact, I've been delaying this long enough. Let's talk about Gurky. Gurky was probably the worst change they made in this adaptation. In the book, he was actually kind of a badass. Yeah, he was afraid for a lot of the story, but he faced his fears and overcame. He fought two dwarves, members of a warrior race, mind you, at the same time, and walked into a room tossing both of them around. He single-handedly attacked a warrior king after all of his friends had been tossed around like ragdolls. True, he got his ass kicked, but he was awesome for doing it. Not only could this furry little bastard not take anyone in a fight, not even these little pixies, but he runs away from conflict no less than three times throughout the movie. As obnoxious as his voice is, it's not the worst quality I find in the movie's version of Gurgi. But all that builds to a head when we reach the climax of the movie. The Horned King activates the cauldron and begins raising an army, promising to throw the remaining three heroes in. Eventually. However, Gurgi finally shows up to do something. He unties everyone, but then Terran steps up to stop the cauldron. Unlike in the book, there's no way to destroy the cauldron for good, and the reason why will reveal itself later. But a person can throw themselves inside the cauldron to negate everything the evil pot has done. There's just one catch. A living being must climb into it of his own free will. Gurgi is bold and brave. He will climb into the evil cauldron. However, the poor duckling will never climb out alive. Yikes! And finally, Gurgi does something selfless. Taran has many friends. Gurgi has no friends. Gurgi! No! Don't jump! Wait! No! 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 Ah! Oh, yes! Ugh, oh, you can try to make this as emotional as you want, but I'm just glad that annoying squeaky voiced bastard is gone! So Gurgi's sacrifice ruins the undead army, and the Horned King meets Terran for their final confrontation together. Now, Pig Keeper, you shall die! No! No! <laughs> Yeah, Terran's final blow is a gentle nudge. How thrilling. The Black Cauldron just pulls the Horned King inside itself. 
In fact, our brave hero barely does anything. In the books, everyone was always turning to Taran to make a decision, so even if he wasn't the one to make the final blow, you got to see Taran grow and develop as a character which made him important. In the movie, he makes the occasional decision, but several things happen by accident, coincidence, or he's pushed along by someone else. And the writers didn't know how to properly frame the weight of his decisions, so a lot of his choices seem like the obvious call. Of course they should escape the Horn King's castle. Of course they should find and destroy the Black Cauldron. But this version of Terran doesn't grow from the weight of his decisions. He's just a kid going on an adventure. Besides, in the book, he made for a good role model for kids through his perseverance and developed leadership skills. But can you really say the same for this guy? So the Horned King is killed and the erupting pot destroys the castle. Just the way a proper final boss fight should end. However, we're not quite done yet. See, unlike in the book, the Black Cauldron isn't destroyed when someone sacrifices themselves to it, so that means the witches get to come back and offer a trade for the Cauldron's return. They first offer Terran his sword back, but like a dumbass, he declines it in exchange for Gurgi's life. Dear. It's not possible. Just as I thought, ladies. You've got no real power! Admit it! Admit it! Uh, jackass? They turned you into a frog and back. I wouldn't go and provoke them like that. So, Gurgi is brought back to life, taking away any worth or meaning to his sacrifice, and our heroes march off together. You did well, my boy. Yep. <laughs> A medieval tale that has no lasting impression and no interesting characters. How the hell did they screw up this badly? The book wasn't bad, but it was something of an acquired taste for me. The writing style started out amateurish, and the dialogue was prolonged and awkward, but there was a clear improvement the more I read. So much so that by the second book, I was actually excited to see where it would go next. And the characters really grow on you. Plus, as kids' books, they have several good lessons to teach, like the importance of facing your fears and how it's okay to make mistakes. I look forward to reading the rest of the series. The first two books of the Chronicles of Perdane get a collective 4 out of 5. Now the movie was an interesting mess. From a technical perspective, it's fine for the most part. The music is great, and the animation and character designs are good, save for some of the awkward early CGI and a number of continuity errors. However, the characters have little to offer and the story doesn't really entertain. This might have been different if they included Prince Gwydion and tried to match Terran's growth from the books. Then again, their initial attempt was to take a kid's book and make it measurably more graphic, which did drive a lot of people away. I wouldn't say this movie is so bad it's good, though it seems to have attracted a cult following, kind of like what The Room or Birdemic did. If you're a fan, you certainly could do a lot worse than this. Personally, I wasn't crazy about it and I doubt I'll come back to this one. As a movie, The Black Cauldron gets a 2 out of 5. Now this didn't do so well as an adaptation. Combining the first two books was ambitious, and with better structure, they really could have had something. But the characters had none of their charm, and what they did with Gurgi was borderline unforgivable. Plus, reading up on the history of the movie, there seemed to be a lot of contention as to who the target audience was. Was it for kids? Then why have all the violence that they originally planned? Was it for an older audience? Then why mellow out the characters and turn Gurgi into a mascot? This project seemed doomed from the start. As an adaptation, it gets a 2 out of 5. A simple read, but enjoyable nonetheless. I'll likely return to the world of Perdane someday, but for now, there's a lot of work to do for the next episode. It's the return of the big blockbuster bastardization. And you guys had better bring plenty of water, because we're heading to one hell of a desert. Oh yes, the spice must flow.
Chris. <laughs>